The headlines are full of enormously massive numbers. They're mind-boggling. For example, here in the UK, we spend over £100 billion a year on the NHS. We spend £15 billion on our mobile phones. We even spend £80 million a year on peanuts. Now, I'm a physicist, so I'm a massive numbers geek. But these figures just don't mean anything to me. I don't know what a million pounds looks like, much less a hundred billion. So I started to try to come up with a way to get these figures into a context that I could understand. And once they are on a scale where the numbers make sense, one set stands out in particular. The amount that we spend on science funding, or rather the lack of it. The science -gram aims to give you a short tour of UK public funding of science and to show you that the amount that we spend on scientific research is dwarfed by the size of the problems that science is trying to solve. So I'd like to kick off with one of those mind-bogglingly enormous numbers. The UK government spends about 695 billion on all of our behalves every single year. And again, that's just a number I can't make sense of. So the way that we tried to start to understand it was by dividing it up into pounds per person per year. So if we take that 700 billion pounds and divide it by the 63 million population of the United Kingdom, you get about 11,000 pounds per person, which is spent by the government on all of our behalves. Now suddenly that number makes a lot more sense to me. It's on about the same scale as a salary or perhaps a year's rent. But where does that 11,000 pounds go? Well, the sort of big ticket items are all fairly obvious and actually basically laudable uh, ways to spend our money. We have about £4,000 on the biggest single pot of money, which is what's called social protection. That's things like benefits and pensions and that sort of stuff. We spend £2,000 a year on healthcare, £1,000 on education, £700 on defence, and then obviously there's quite a big miscellaneous sort of catch-all other category for all the other function of, functions of government that I've not included in those first few. So everything from parks and playgrounds to policing. Now, science is funded out of a variety of different mechanisms from all of those different pots. And the total amount that we spend on scientific research funded by the government in the UK is about £160 per person per year. Now, at the moment, I don't really know if that's a lot or a little, because on the one hand, it looks quite small compared to some of those other items of government expenditure. It's a little bit less than 1.5% of total government spending. But on the other hand, if I got a £160 tax rebate every year, I could probably buy myself a cool gadget or something. So it doesn't seem like such a small amount of money. I think to truly understand how much we spend on science, we need to look at it compared to the size of the problems it's trying to solve. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is health. And one way to try and get a handle on health is to look at what kills us. So cancer kills about 30% of people, and yet we spend just £4.30 per person per year on cancer research. Now, if there's a disease that's got nearly a third chance of killing me, I want to spend more than a five a year trying to work out why. And <laughs> bizarrely, this is the best funded condition by quite some way. So heart disease kills 15% of people, and we spend £1.30 per person per year researching it. And stroke kills 10% of people, so a third as many as cancer. And we spend just 28 pence per person per year trying to understand what it is and look for treatments. Um, I mean, not to be patronising, but this is a picture of 28 pence. That is your total annual contribution to stroke research. And, you know, that's slightly insulting as a tip in a restaurant, let alone a contribution to a disease that kills 10% of people. So obviously, there's more to life than death, right? And um, one of the major achievements of modern medical research has been not just to uh, change uh, how and when we die, but to improve the quality of our lives. Now, that's something that's very hard to get a quantitative handle on. So one way we could try to look at it is by looking at the economic costs of diseases. So, for example, uh, dementia is a really interesting disease because it's not particularly deadly in that not very many deaths are directly caused by dementia, but it is a very expensive disease. So let's have a look at how much it costs us. The first and most obvious cost of dementia are the direct costs, the health and the social care, so treating people with dementia and looking after them. And that comes out at about £160 per person per year. And I'd just like to emphasise here, that's not per dementia patient. That's every single person in the United Kingdom. And actually, the direct costs of dementia are smaller than the indirect costs. Um, now, this is caused by all sorts of different stuff, but a really leading cause is that a lot of people whose friends or relatives have dementia will give up work or go part-time to, uh, to look after the patients. And this, when you add up all these different sort of economic knock-ons that the disease has, that comes to about £200 per person per year. So we add those up, we get dementia costing £360 per person per year. It's a lot of money. 
We spend 60 pence per person per year on dementia research, and um, that little green line up there, that's not a graphic design element, that's actually got an area that's in proportion to the amount that we spend. Um, so you can do a similar sort of analysis with the other diseases that I mentioned, and cancer, heart disease, stroke and dementia all combined come to over £800 per person per year of economic impact, and yet we spend just £7 on the very research which could, which could reduce that economic cost, and indeed the human cost, of these very widespread diseases. So that's given us a bit of an overview of health, but this really is a problem that recurs throughout science. For example, we spend £2,200 per person per year in the UK on energy. Now this really is everything. This is fueling your car, heating your home, lighting our shops and powering our factories. And if you add up all the different ways that we spend money on energy, it comes out as this huge £2,200 figure. And yet we spend somewhere in the region of £10 per person per year on energy research. Now, the first obvious reason why that's a problem is that we could use some of that £10 to reduce that £2,200. We could make producing energy cheaper. But there are also a lot of knock-on effects to how we generate that energy. A lot of that £2,200 is being spent on forms of energy generation that are environmentally unsustainable, where causing dangerous climate change, emitting carbon dioxide and all sorts of other pollutants. And so we should really be spending more money to try and work out how to make energy production greener. Now, one technology I'd like to concentrate on just for a second is nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion would be an absolutely incredible source of electricity generation, if only we could get it to work. Um, it's the source of energy that powers the sun. So it works by fusing together hydrogen atoms, smashing them into helium, and when they do stick together, they release a vast quantity of energy. Now, this would be an absolutely transformative technology for several reasons. Firstly, because it's powered by hydrogen, um, you can find that in seawater. So fusion is literally powered by seawater. We have tens of millions of years worth of fuel down here on the surface of the Earth. It doesn't emit any carbon dioxide or other pollutants. And in spite of the fact it's got the word nuclear in the name, there's not even any serious long-term radioactive waste. So this could completely change the way that we generate electricity. And the good news is, with fusion, we've done it. This is a picture of the inside of a fusion reactor in Cullum in Oxfordshire. And on the right-hand side there, you can see a photograph that was taken actually during nuclear fusion. That pink stuff is the very, very hot gas that you use uh, to make the technology work. We just need to find a way to get from these experimental reactors up to uh, reactors that can generate electricity on the grid you know, 24 hours a day. The problem with nuclear fusion is that when you mention it to people, they normally say one of three things. Hasn't that been 30 years away for the last 30 years? Hasn't that been 50 years away for the last 50 years? Or hasn't that been 30 years away for the last 50 years? <laughs> now, I think, as well as being really quite rude to the scientists who are working on nuclear fusion, who've obviously made some pretty big leaps in the last 30 or the last 50 years, it also shows a fundamental misunderstanding in the way that scientific discovery works. It doesn't really make sense to think of science um, as being a certain number of years away, because in order to discover something, you have to be trying. No amount of time not looking for a cure for cancer is going to find one. So I think it's much more important to think of these things as being a certain number of person hours, or perhaps a certain investment away from fruition. So one estimate of how much it'll cost to get us from the experimental reactors we're at now to generating electricity with fusion is 60 billion pounds. That sounds like an awful lot of money, until you think this is definitely a global endeavour because it would transform electricity generation around the world. And therefore, we can share out that money amongst a really large number of people. For example, we could divide it by 1.1 billion, which is the population of the high-income countries, so the richest billion people in the world. We could all afford to pitch in. And if you do that division, it comes out as £50 per person. I'd put my £50 on the table right now. And What's even better is we wouldn't have to do that all at once. Because if you gave the scientists in charge of fusion 60 billion quid, they wouldn't need to spend it all at once because they've got to build labs and train scientists to use the equipment and do the experiments. So we could even scrape together our 50 quid over a number of years. So I think this really shows just how cheap scientific discovery can be. So now I've shown you uh, quite a lot of ways in which science is very, very small compared to some very, very big things. What I'd like to show you next is, um, is some things that are on a more similar scale to science. This is actually very, very difficult. The ideal thing I'd like is some other forms of public expenditure that are on similar sort of sizes to these five and ten pounds per person per year. But it's very, very difficult to find one that isn't in some obscure government department and some budget you've never heard of. So instead, I'm going to try and compare it to some items of personal spending. Um, so just for reference up at the top there, I'm going to have some of the numbers that I've been talking about so far. And since we've spoken a lot about health, 
I thought I'd talk about the amount that we spend on alcohol. So here in the UK, we spend about £600 per person per year on booze. Now, I'm not for a minute suggesting that we should abolish alcohol and put all that money into scientific research. I like a beer as much as the next guy. But if you're an alien and you touch down on Earth and you're trying to understand this strange civilization you found yourself in, you might log on to the Office of National Statistics website. And the first thing you'd think is, my God, this species have a lot to learn about web design. But if you did... But if you did eventually find the data that you were looking for, you'd see that these creatures spend 600 quid a year getting drunk and five pounds a year on a disease that kills a third of them. So this, this just doesn't make sense. Now, another statistic I love is how much we spend on weddings. It's about 160 pounds per person per year in the UK. And um, if you take the cost of the average wedding and divide it by the length of the average marriage, that comes out as about £700 a year, which just dwarfs any of the money that we spend on science. Finally, loo roll. We spend £17 per person per year on toilet paper. And again, I don't want a world where there's 10% more science but no toilet paper. That's not somewhere I want to live. But I don't know that I'm perfectly efficient with my toilet paper. I think I could probably use 10% less if I really tried. And that would give me £1.70 a year to play with. And it's just baffling because I could triple heart disease research. I could transform how much science we're doing about stroke. And I think what this slide really shows is that once these numbers start to look a bit less ridiculous, then we're really getting somewhere with science funding. So I've shown you a lot of stuff in terms of pounds per person per year, but I thought I'd like to show you finally some aggregate numbers, some sort of totals for scientific projects. So I've got some scientific numbers down on the right-hand side, and then on the left I've compared them to other items from government and uh, the wider economy. So the first one I'd like to start with is in the top right, the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, which you've probably heard of because the Higgs boson was discovered there uh, late last year. Now, that's often cited as a massive, expensive scientific project, which... Um, which is, and it, indeed it is, it's cost us £2.6 billion, pounds, which, which is a lot of money. But you've got to remember that that money has been shared between a huge number of countries. It's a massive international collaboration. Um, it's actually funded by subscription. If you find out how much the UK pays in a subscription to CERN, it's about £1.50 per person per year, which is just a little bit more than we spend on peanuts. So discovering the Higgs boson literally cost peanuts. <laughs> and... If you look at other similar sort of items of infrastructure spending, the London Olympics, which was done by just one country, we could have had an extremely large Hadron Collider for that £9 billion. Um, if we look at fusion, I've mentioned that fusion we think will cost about £60 billion to develop. And on the comparison I've got there is UK public debt. So that's all the money that the government owes various different people. Um, we could develop fusion on our own, and it wouldn't transform our public finances. It's not going to dramatically change the amount of debt that we have. Then we can look on the next line down. The amount of money that was spent globally on all kinds of health research is somewhere in the region of £600 billion. Again, it sounds like a lot of money, but it's about a third as much as the US alone spent invading Iraq. They could have paid effectively for that amount of money. They could have paid for 30 years of health spending globally three times over with the amount of money that they spent. And the final example that I've got is uh, what's called the Human Genome Project, which um, cost £3.4 billion, pounds, and between sort of the 90s and the early 2000s, sequenced every single letter of the human genetic code. So it was a massive, uh, mainly in the US, but an international scientific research project. And a recent study says that the return on that investment, the amount of money that's been generated by, uh, by commercial enterprises profiting from it, is somewhere in the region of £485 billion. Pounds. Now, that's £140 for every single pound that was invested. So even if, the, even if this study is slightly wrong, it'd have to be wildly inaccurate in order for this not to have made, a, made quite an impressive profit. And that almost pays for the last 30 years of medical research. So you only need a few items in science to pay back these incredible amounts in order to cover um, the cost of all of the rest of it. So that was the science -ogram. From health to energy, and indeed across all of science, um, the size of our expenditure on science is dwarfed by the magnitude of these problems that we're trying to solve. I hope that that's provided a bit of context and shown you where science fits into our government spending and indeed the economy in general. And I hope that you can now agree with me that more spending on science would make sense. Thank you. <laughs>